So I'm Caitlin Kaluja. I spoke yesterday, so some of you might have seen me yesterday. I manage the search engine marketing team at Shipple. Um, today we're going to talk about, yesterday I talked a lot about metrics and, you know, looking at, at stats and that kind of thing. And now I'm going to talk about kind of the front end of when you add content, how do you optimize that content? And I have a lot of slides, so um, hopefully we'll get through everything. So Tabby is going to be my timer. Um, my byline is SEO the crap out of your website, and that's not what I wanted to say, but I thought that would be safer. <laughs> that would be safer terminology to use. Um, so the first point that I want to talk about is that content is king, and I'm sure you've heard this. I'm sure on the internet, um, your content for SEO, content is king. Great, unique, relevant content is the best way you can optimize your website. If you ever ask anybody at Google kind of, what is my silver bullet? What's the one thing I can do? They'll always say, make really great content so people will want to read it. So um, that's sort of the overarching theme. But um, we'll talk about, sorry, there's a little bit of an echo. <laughs> uh, today we're going to talk about general tips when you're adding content. And then we'll go through tips and kind of checklists for these specific types of content. So we've got video, press release, photo albums, job listings, and blog posts. So those are kind of the you know, these tips are going to apply to all kinds of different content, but we sort of specifically we will talk about those guys. So these are general tips. My theme is graffiti and robots. That's sort of my, my theme here. So um, your, my biggest tip, like I said, fresh, unique content is good for search engines and it's good for people. Um, at the end of the day, if people come back to your site, you know, you don't, SEO is not a way to trick people into coming to your site because you know, if they get there and you don't have great content, you don't have things they're interested in looking at, then it, it, it doesn't matter. You know, why are you sending people to your site if they're not then picking up the phone or filling out a volunteer application or doing, you know, whatever you want them to do? So that's kind of, like I said, the overarching theme. Another big thing with search engines, search engines are deaf and blind. Um, you think of them as, we call them spiders a lot of times. A lot of times there's a, it's almost like a robot, you know, a little crawler that goes through and grabs all of the information on your site, and they're looking at the code. They're looking at the back end. They're looking at the, the text version of your site. So um, you know, anytime you upload a photo or a video, just keep in mind that the search engines, they're only seeing kind of the text of that. Another big theme that we deal with a lot in SEO is location targeting. Anytime that you want to target your audience even further, if you can use location, do it. If you only serve Texas or Houston or you know whatever, it, be sure to, to let the search engines know that, you know, include that information. Talk about yourself as a Houston web design company, you know, because anytime that's going to target and focus in your audience. So like for Shipple, so Google's job is to provide the best answer to the person's question. So for Shipple, we, not, we may not be the best answer for just website. That's probably going to be a Wikipedia article about what is a website, how does it work, but website design, and then if I take it further and I say, you know, Houston website design, then maybe we, we are the best answer for that. So anytime you can kind of hone in on that, use it. Also, um, a big theme, avoid duplicate content. This is one that we'll have clients who have, you know, they're part of an organization and they have content in this place, and then maybe they have their own website and they have the exact same content over here. If Google thinks that's malicious, they'll ding you for that. So you want to be careful if you're posting, you know, exactly the same thing in multiple places. And there are some exceptions that we'll talk about, like press releases, but um, yeah. And then crosslink, be sure that at any point, I tend to think if it's good for a person, it's good for a user. So you don't ever want a person to get to a page and go, I don't know where else to go. I don't know what else to do. You want to include crosslinks to other parts of your site so that you say, oh, well, if you're interested in this, you may also like this, or you may, you know, if you're on a page about volunteering, well, maybe you want to see some stories from our volunteers, or if you're on a page about this product, that's similar to this product. So you want to include that cross-linking where you can. So uh, idea generation I want to talk a little bit about. So we're going to talk about optimizing your content, but just some tips for coming up with what kind of content can I add to my site. Uh, think about your goals. Think about your audience. What does your audience want to know? What are the top questions you get asked all the time? You know, ask whoever answers the phone at your company. I bet they know the same. You know, they probably get similar questions over and over. So can you make content around how do I do this or what about this or you know things like um, if somebody's a, if your company and a lot of people are evaluating you, maybe you want to put case studies or you want to put. Um, examples of your work or that kind of thing. Think about what your audience wants to see from you. 
Also, you can look at what's working. Um, this screenshot right here is from Google Analytics, which I'm a big fan of Google Analytics. That's pretty much all I talked about yesterday. So Google Analytics is a free analytics tool that gives you lots of data about your site. If you're a Shipple client, we've already installed it, and we can give you access. Just you know, ask us, and we can give you access to this. But this is showing me what keywords are bringing people to my site. And this is the Shipple blog. And you'll notice that um, ice chest radio plans and cooler radio are at the top of this list. And that's from um, our technology director, Rodney, who is awesome, wrote a post about how to create a, take an ice chest and turn it into a radio and float it on the river. And so it holds your beer and plays, you know, songs. And, you know, that's, it's very random. And it's, you know, it's technology related. It kind of shows a little bit about our culture. But that actually brings in, you'd be surprised how many people search for something like that. So you may have content or pages that are kind of sticking that you didn't even think about were, you know, were really a huge draw. So you can kind of see if there's anything weird like that. Like we have this uh, Facebook virus post we wrote that gets tons of traffic. So that tells me if anytime there's kind of a Facebook security update, well, that's something that our audience cares about. Um, another thing that we think about when we do kind of idea generation is link bait, which when I say link bait, I mean the kinds of posts that people are more likely to read and share. So some things that we'll do a lot of is like, anytime you can put top 10 ways to do whatever, you know, even if, uh, and, and it's in that list of kind of like one, two, three, people tend to read that and click on that link because it's a little more digestible. Also, anytime you can use hot topics or if there's something in the news, like um, we have a client who's in, they do HR outsourcing. And so anytime there's a big company that had some kind of HR debacle or something, um, we'll write a blog post and we'll sort of reference that, but then relate it back to something they do. And then, you know, if people are searching Chipotle HR or, you know, whatever, well, then they, um, you know, they might see us. It's sort of, we're kind of piggybacking off of that in the news. Um, infographics, people love infographics. And uh, does everybody know what an infographic is? Okay. So an infographic is essentially, um, you take a complicated thing and you make a very pretty, you know, like one page uh, visual d display of it. And people love to share that. People love to click on that. People love to like, share it with their friends and send it out. So, um, you know, we don't all have designers that we can go, oh, make me a cool infographic about this. But, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that people love to share. Also, how-tos and FAQs, that's something that a lot of our clients forget about. You know, if, um, if you're a doctor, you can tell me what the procedure that you're going to do does. But what people want to know is, how long does it last? What does it take? Is it going to hurt? You know, like, how long am I going to be off of work? Sometimes that you sort of forget about that what are those kind of FAQs, you know, that you can add and create content around. So that's my sort of intro. Now we're going to get into each of the different types of content. So the first one's video. Um, just some stats, and I'm not going to read all of these to you, but uh, video is a big deal, <laughs> is what this says. Three billion YouTube videos get watched every single day. That's crazy. There's just a ton, ton of people out there watching videos. Videos tell stories. That's why videos are so, so powerful. Um, I saw Kurt speak yesterday, and uh, I guarantee the videos were said more than he could have ever said standing up there, because videos are so powerful, and they tell stories in an amazing way. Um, there's all kinds of stats, like this one is, for the third one is from 2008, and I've I would imagine that it's probably even more now that when you do a Google search, you know, sometimes you see images, sometimes you see videos, sometimes you see all different things. Um, Comscore did a study of about a million different keywords, and they found that 38% of the time a video popped up. Well, I guarantee you there are more websites about that keyword than videos. So, you know, if you have a video about that, you're probably a little more likely to show. Also, search engines tend to crawl video sites a little faster because, especially YouTube, because as you probably know, Google owns YouTube, so they crawl YouTube really quickly. And I've read stories of people who they post a video and it's in the search results in like five minutes, where if you wrote a page, it might take a month for Google to figure out your page is there. So some basics of YouTube. YouTube is sort of the, YouTube, if YouTube were a search engine, it would be number two. More people search YouTube than Yahoo, than Bing, than anything but Google. YouTube is just a huge audience. So if you're going to post videos, put them on YouTube. Um, just some basic kind of things you can do when you post a video to think about SEO is you get 100 characters for your title. It's about 15 words. Use it all. Um, you want to include, this is what we do typically. We'll put the name of the video and then like a pipe or a dash or something 
put whatever the category is and then the name of your company. So that way your, you know, your name of your company is in there, that sort of category keyword is in there a little bit instead of just the name of the video. Um, and like I said, that's about 15 words, so be sure you use it. Uh, we put the name of the company at the end and not at the beginning because I figure, you know, Shipple's a funny word. You wouldn't search for Shipple unless you kind of knew who we were, you were looking for us. So you should rank well for the name of your company. So it's good to include it, but it, it doesn't need to be the first thing. It can be kind of at the end of the, of the title. With the description, you get 5,000 characters and you can include links. So be sure you put descriptive information, you include a link back, you know, you know, if it's a testimonial, say, oh, you know, if this is interesting to you, maybe you want to click back and learn about this product or this service or, you know, something related that sort of takes them back to your website. With the tags, you get 120 characters, use all of that, um, and then you get to pick a thumbnail. And as some of you know, um, you, they don't give you a ton of choices. You get three choices, uh, and it's usually a screenshot of the beginning of the video, about a quarter of the way through and about half of the way through. So when you pick one, pick a thumbnail with kind of action going on. And they've done studies that people are more likely to click on a face than on text. So if you can pick a, you know, a face of a person instead of the title slide, that's going to be better. Um, also timing, keep it around two minutes. There's some exceptions to this, like, you know, we do webinars or training or something where someone's really invested and they will sit and watch a 10 minute or 20 minute or hour long video. But for the most part, if you're just trying to grab people's attention, keep it short and sweet. Um, a little bit of advanced YouTube. You can create a playlist out of your YouTube videos and you can actually add descriptions and tags to that playlist. So if you do a search in YouTube, you'll see the videos and you'll see these playlists kind of pop up. So again, it's all about competition and there are fewer playlists than videos. So if you have a playlist about this topic, then you may be a little le more likely to, to show up. You can also add closed captions. So I mentioned that Google's deaf and blind. They can't tell exactly what is in your video, but you can add closed captions. So like this example, so we put, you know, down here at the bottom, it says, hi, I'm Sandra Zimmer. So everything she says, we put the text, we sort of attached it to the video so that, um, you know, Google knows exactly the words in this video. What is this video about? And the way you do that is you log in and you'll see this edit captions up at the top. And you can just take a text notepad and type out all the words. And sometimes you can start with, um, Google will take a stab at it and you can say, you know, kind of auto-generate one and start from there and then change any words that they didn't catch. You'd be surprised how well they, you know, actually can catch a lot of the words based on voice recognition, um, which is, I, I, is interesting to me. And, you know, I kind of see a future where maybe they are digesting those videos and trying to figure out what the text in the video is and using that in search results, which is kind of crazy. But I try not to think too much about <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, another thing with YouTube, keyword research. So a lot of times in SEO, we'll do keyword research for how people search in Google. You can do kind of informal keyword research in YouTube. Um, if you notice, if you start typing something in a search box, it will try to auto-correct and auto, you know, say, oh, I, it will auto-fill what you're typing. Those are the most popular searches. So Sandra does public speaking videos. So if I start to type public speaking and it auto-corrects and says, you know, public speaking tips, well, then I know that's probably the most searched term around that topic. So you can kind of start to type things and see what shows up at the top of the list and do some kind of informal keyword research there. Um, Vimeo, I want to talk a little bit about. Vimeo is another video provider. It's different than YouTube. It's sort of based around, it's about 10% of the market. You can do more HD video. You can upload longer videos. Um, our hour-long webinars I talked about, we'll upload them on Vimeo because we can do that for free. YouTube, it's about 12 minutes you get. Um, this audience is a little bit more I like to think of them as an artistic community, people who are uploading their short films or they're uploading, you know, that kind of video tend to be on Vimeo. A lot of our clients like Vimeo because when you embed it, you can strip pretty much everything out. So with YouTube, it looks like YouTube. If on Vimeo, you can strip all the Vimeo stuff out so it just looks like a video. It could be, you know, it looks more like as if you had posted your own kind of thing. You know, there's not as much branding that's not you. Um, if you're going to use Vimeo, we love Vimeo. Like I said, we use it a lot of times. Um, I recommend cross-posting. Put your video on YouTube and put it on Vimeo. And whichever one you embed in your website, you know, is kind of up to you, but have it in both places. You also want to post your video to your site. You want to create a page and embed the video on your site. 
Um, this is, again, this is Sandra with her public speaking videos, and we have a page that lists all of, it's a series of 10, so it lists all of them, and then each one has its own page. So then we can optimize the page, and it's great content, and instead of sending people to YouTube, she can send people to her website, where they can watch the videos there, you know, surrounded by all this other content around her brand. Oh, you can also submit a video sitemap, and these will be up online, and there's a link on how to do that, or if, if you Google how to submit a video sitemap, Google has great instructions. So here's my video checklist, um, and I have one of these for each of them. So did you use an SEO-friendly title? Did you use all your characters, and did you include some keywords? Does your description include keywords and a link back to your site? Um, did you use tags? Did you use closed captions? And did you embed it on your site? So those are kind of my, that's my checklist when I'm adding a video. Any questions so far? Yeah. yeah. Can you be a little bit more specific as far as the closed Oh, so with the closed captions, it's a good question. So um, with the closed captions, what you're actually adding is the, the sound on the video. So every word that she's saying, I'm typing out. So um, you know, if I'm a speaker and I'm you know, talking about something, you can actually put the words that they're saying on there. Yeah, they'll all be up on shippelcon.com. I think probably next week they're all going to go up. Um, I can put it up on SlideShare too. If you go to, um, so this, I'm QKate on most of the web. If you go to slideshare.net slash QKate, I'll upload it right after this so that it's there. Yeah. One of the points on video is that you're not going to use one of these sites to prep your video. Right. Is there Yes. So yeah, the point is, if you're not going to use a site like the, of these, if you're going to upload the raw, you know, like flash file or the, the movie file that you actually get, I always recommend to use one of those sites. And you can use one like, you can actually lock it down so that you can't view it on YouTube or Vimeo. You can only view it on your website if it's something that's, you know, something you need to lock down. So even, and I recommend using those when you can because, like you said, if the codex isn't right, if the file's too big, you know, if something goes wrong, it's YouTube's gonna handle all of that for you and you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to load the whole video before it starts. You do that you know, kind of buffering where it loads a little bit of it and you can play it right away. And, um, so I definitely recommend going with one of those, even if it's something that like, we have a client that does, they offer video only to their members, so they'll lock it down on YouTube so it lives on YouTube, but you can't actually get to it unless you're logged into their site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so any of these, like this one we've got, I mean, I would just put what it's about. So if it's a, you know, if it's like this one is a public speaking and she's talking about a certain point, I would kind of describe, you know, give a synopsis of what's going on. So if it's a case study or a testimonial, I would say, you know, such and such client worked with us in this service and we provided this for them. You know, just, just be descriptive and, and kind of summarize what's going on. So I would use, you know, kind of the service and the keywords and, and anything that, you know, I would, one of the tags I would do is like your company and whatever the service and the company that you're talking about and kind of any, anything that's related. Do you have a question, Albert? I, say, I mean, sir. Uh, Chris, Exactly. Yep. Cool. Okay, we'll go. Um, next, we're going to talk about press releases and news stories. Um, I am not usually the one that submits press releases to like the PR engines, but I put a little bit of data around that. Um, you can submit your press releases to other, like we use Pitch Engine, which is $29 every time you submit a press release, and PR Web is about $140. Um, there are free services as well. These are the two that we use, and essentially what that means is they put it out on the wire, so they share your press release kind of with the world. Um, most of these, you get up to three locations, so they'll say, okay, we're gonna share it with these three different cities. Choose your locations wisely. Um, if you're based in Houston, maybe you do, 
Houston, Dallas, and Austin, or you know, you know, make those decisions, kind of pick where those cities need to be. You can also include links back to your site. And so a lot of these services, you get up to about five links that you can link back, use all of them, link back to your homepage if you're talking about a certain service, link back to that page you know, about that, or a certain event, link back to the page about that. A lot of times you can include links to your social media and they count separately. So if you have, if you know, if you're using a source where you can do that, do it. You know, link to your Twitter, link to your Facebook, link to as much as you can get your links out on the web, the better. And most of these also include their own analytics as far as, you know, how how often they've been shared, how often they've been read, that kind of thing. Um, and this is an example of PR web. So you'll see um, we use so this is. Uh, so this is for an event. So we used human resources symposium in the title. We used, you know, HR in the byline. We used, you know, some keywords in the quotes. So you would just want to think about those keywords, you know, even when you're writing press releases. Um, as far as timing, usually you'll submit about three days before they actually go live. And you want to also post those on your site on that same day. And it's sort of the general rule of them with press releases is Monday is good, Friday is bad. We always joke that if you're telling bad news, host, uh, post your press release on the Friday before a holiday because nobody's going to read it. <laughs> so, um, and then I mentioned duplicate content, and this is one of the sort of exceptions to the rule. So Google's really good about identifying malicious duplicate content. They're pretty smart, and they know, you know, a press release, it may be posted on this side, and this side, and your side, and it might get picked up by somebody, and it's exactly the same, but they know that that's not malicious. And ten what tends to happen is that they'll sort of group them together, and they'll go, oh, this link, and this link, and this link, and this link, they're all the same press release, and they'll pick one, and that's the one they'll show in search results. So, you know, some SEO people will say, oh, post it on your site right before it gets posted anywhere else so that Google can kind of tell that it got posted on your site first, so you're the, you know, you're the uh, URL of record, I guess. You're the one that, you know, you're the original source. Um, so, um, yeah, they're going to select what they think is the best URL. I, what my thought is, is if you're linking back to your site, they should be able to tell that, oh, this is the original source because you're linking back to your site in the press release. This is my press release checklist, short and sweet, SEO friendly title, use tags, include all your link backs, including link backs to your social media, and then post on your site as well. Um, next we're going to talk about online photo albums. So photo content, first I want to talk about the content of a photo. I mentioned that a video is a great way to tell a story, a photo is the same way. The photos are really powerful on a lot of our websites over half of the traffic is from photos alone. You know, people, we have clients who, you know, people will go through every single photo. You know, some of our, well, some of our plastic surgery clients, they'll go through every single photo of all the nose jobs and print one out and go, this is the one I want. And, you know, we do sites for like, um, like for the YMCA for their summer camp, their photos, they are moms and aunts and uncles and grandmas, they're sharing and their photos get all of the traffic on their site. So photos are extremely powerful. You want to tell a story with your photos. You want to take as many different kinds of photos as you can and tag as many people as you can. Um, and another big rule that Ed is really good about when he takes photos is make people look good. People like to share photos where they look good. So, um, you know, if somebody is not looking great in a photo, maybe, you know, don't worry about putting it up there because they're not there, you know. If they look good, they're more likely to share it. Also, you want to link back to your site if you're posting photos on like Flickr or somewhere else. You want to link back and say, learn more about this event, find more about your event. Um, and then you want to follow up an event with photos. This is something that people also sort of, you know, you do all this work to get to this event and then it's really fantastic and the next day you're exhausted and you just don't go put up your photos. So the, a big thing is don't forget about that kind of after event photo part of it. As far as the technical SEO part, oh, do you have a question? Yeah, I'll put a, a, that's a good question. So the question is if you're posting on like a Flickr or Facebook or somewhere that's not your site, what kind of description do you use? Um, I will put, even if I put a similar description on every one, I'll put the name of the event, the date, the per, you know, the, if our company hosted it. And sometimes for Shipple, like we'll post photos for client events and we'll say, you know, photo by Shipple, but this is a Houston Zoo event or, you know, something. And then link back on your site if, if there's an applicable link. Um, for more technical, make sure that your descriptions are unique. 
Um, because essentially, you know, like I said, Google's deaf and blind. So if they see photo with the same description, then they're not necessarily going to realize that's a unique photo. So if you, even if you mix it up just a little bit, just enough so that it's a little bit different, you want to make those descriptions a little bit unique. Um, also, you want to size your photo for the web, whether that means you're using Photoshop or if you're not very technical, you can use Picnic, which is free, and you can size it down. You know, most of our photos, they don't need to be more than about 1,000 pixels wide because, you know, the whole website's probably not 1,000 pixels wide. So unless you're, you know, if you're uploading to Flickr and you really want to have high quality photos that people can download or that kind of thing, but for the most part, you can size them down. Um, also, the file name, this is one of those things that Sometimes if you're uploading a ton, ton of photos, like with uh, ShippleCon, we're uploading like a thousand photos. I guarantee you Sarah's not going to go in and change all the file names. But if you can, if you have time, if you have the luxury of time, if you can use a, a word in your photo file name, the better. So if you can write, you know, black cat with camera instead of, you know, whatever spits out of your, spits out of your camera, that's going to be a little bit better for SEO. Also, this is something I learned recently that Google assumes a JPEG is a photo and that a GIF or a ping it thinks is like an image. So for whatever reason, your you know your photos are spitting out as you're you know you're offloading off their camera and their their pings, which uh, you know most services don't. But if you run into that, that might confuse Google a little bit. Um, Creative Commons. I just want to talk briefly about this is a licensing. It, it lets you. It, this applies to all content, but we we worry about it a lot for photos. It goes beyond the all rights reserved. So essentially, what this does is it allows people, allows people to use your content. And you can say, yes, you can use my content as long as you link back to me, as long as you attribute it to me. So like all of my slide headers, if, you see, if you've been seeing down at the bottom, it says, you know, photo credit with a link back to Flickr. Flickr is really good about this. It's built into Flickr, where people can say, yes, people can use my photos. Ed does this with his photos, and he's been in, he was in like a Korean textbook or something because somebody found his photo and it said, you know, credit Ed Schiphol. So it lets, your it lets people share your photos, and it kind of gives that, that link back to you if they're using it. So there's more on creativecommons.org, but you can say, you know, you can, sh you can use my photo, but you have to be non-commercial, or you can, you know, there's one called share alike where you can actually make changes to it so they could, like, use your photo in the background or, you know, something like that, so. So my photo album checklist, SEO-friendly title, I think that's on all of these, SEO-friendly title, your description includes keywords and links back to your site. Each description is unique, even if it's just a little bit different, each one is unique. You're using tags, and then your file name includes text, which is at the bottom of the list, because I think it's, it's, it's not as important as the other ones, but if you have the time, if you have the luxury, the ability to change your, you know, your, even if it's shippelcon one shippelcon 2 there's a little bit of text in there, that's going to be better. Yeah, do you have a question? Oh, that's a good question. How do you deal with getting consent for photos? Um, it's trickier if you're dealing with, um, like if you're dealing with children, a lot of times you have to get a release ahead of time. We try to take care of as much of that ahead of time as possible. So either in the registration project process or when you, you know, get up to the booth and we try to deal with that as much ahead of time. So when, you know, when it comes time to upload the photos, all you have to do is upload them. Well, not necessarily. Like with ShippleCon, we've been posting pictures, and I don't think anybody signed a consent form. Um, but like I said, if you're dealing with, like, for instance, with children, a lot of times you do have to, you have to be a little bit more cognizant of that. Um, yeah. If you're in a situation where you think it might be a problem, I would get releases ahead of time, just, just to be safe. Oh, so that's a good point. So a lot of times, like on... Um, so we're talking about tagging people, like on Facebook, what Ed will do is he'll post all these pictures, but he won't actually tag anyone, or he may tag like a couple of shipolites that he knows are okay, and then he'll kind of encourage people to go in and tag themselves. So if you didn't want to tag yourself, you didn't have to, and so that sort of keeps us out of you know the, where somebody might be upset that they got tagged and something. But that's a good, that's a really good question. Yeah. Did you run into any problem with location releases? What do you mean? Oh, right. Um, I haven't really run into that. Um, like I said, if I ever think there's going to be an issue, I'll try to ask ahead of time. It's something that sometimes I don't think about, uh, if I'm being honest. <laughs> but um, I, yeah, I guess that what I would do is, is try to get as much of that squared away ahead of time. Usually if somebody shows up with a camera and they're not supposed to be there, someone will say, hey, you're not supposed to be taking pictures. Um, so job listings. 
Um, job listings is an interesting one because people a lot of times don't think to include the word job in their job listing or they don't think to include career or employment. You know, you just post the title of the job and the description of the job and you don't think to include those words, but that's how people search. So this is a tool called Google Insights. Um, I think it's google.com slash insights, but you know, you can search. All these I always say, you can just Google it and find it. <laughs> but, um, what you can do is you can enter up to five keywords up here at the top and it will show you a graph of how popular they are. And I did this one over the last 12 months. And so you can see which keyword is the most popular. And you can actually filter it down to uh, country, state, and city. So you can say, in Houston, how do people search for jobs? So I use what careers, jobs in, employment, hiring, and job openings, because I want to know how do people search for jobs. And you know, if you're an engineering company, you may say jobs in engineering or engineering careers, that you kind of plug in your industry. But like in this example, you can see that jobs in is the clear winner. It's this red line right here. You can also see that around the end of the year and Christmas, people aren't looking for jobs as much, which is interesting. I guess people are also probably not hiring as much around the end of the year. Um, but you can see trends like that. You can see if there's one that's growing or declining. Or, um, so these are the kinds of words that we'll make sure we include in job posts because a lot of times you don't think about that. So my job post checklist is include keywords that are pertinent to your industry. Sometimes you may call a job something, but you know there's, an, there's another industry term that's similar. And what I'll usually do with that is the title may be my, the way I talk about, like, uh, we hire account executives, but essentially they're project managers, and some people may call them one or the other. So in the title, I'll put, you know, account executive, but then in a description, I'll say, like, you know, you're going to manage projects. Or I'll make sure that project manage is in there somewhere so that I get kind of both terms. You also want to make sure you're including those generic words like job, career, employment, um, and include the location name. That's another one people forget, is they'll say, oh, well, my website says I'm in Houston, so my job posting is clearly Houston, but if you don't explicitly say that, then um, you know the search engines might kind of get confused. You may not show up for Houston jobs if you don't have Houston in your job posting. Um, also, text is better than a PDF. Um, a lot of our clients will upload a PDF for a Word doc because that's a little bit easier because they may write it in-house and kind of circulate it on a Word document. If you can put it in text, if you can put it on the page, that's always going to be better. Um, I think this is the last one, blog posts. I think this robot's so cool. Um, most blogs are written in WordPress. We just saw Matt speak, and so I put some specific WordPress-related things up here. Um, these are some of the SEO plugins that we use, that we love. The first one is the Google Analytics plugin. So um, I mentioned I love Google Analytics. If you're using a site like WordPress or Drupal, there are plugins that do a lot of the heavy lifting. All you have to do is sign up for an account, and you'll get an account number. And you just plug in your account number, and it does the rest. It puts the code on every page. It sets everything up. It does all, the, it does all of that for you. you just, so this plugin is great. Again, if you're a Shipple client, we've probably already done this for you, but um, just to be aware. Um, there's a plugin called Yoast SEO, and what that does, that's what the screenshot over here is. On every single page and every single blog post, it adds extra fields where you can update the SEO title, the meta description, the meta keyword on, you know, from the interface. So it becomes something that's not very technical. You just, you're writing your post, you scroll down to the bottom, and instead of, you know, you have your, your title that shows on the page, and then you have your SEO title that's actually called the title tag that shows up. Like in, it'll show up in the blue bar at the top of the page, and it can be different than what's actually on the page. So you can include a little bit more keywords in the meta title, in the meta description down there. Also, there's a plugin called Yet Another Related Post Plugin that I love. I'm a big fan of. I mentioned if you're on a page, you don't ever want somebody to get stuck. You don't want them to not know what's coming next. So what that does is it takes the categories, the tags, the content that are in this post, and it says, oh, this is related to these other posts that you've already written, and it shows it automatically on every, po on every post so that if somebody's reading and they get to the end, they say, oh, well, here's some other posts that are kind of similar. So it helps drive traffic to those older posts that might have, excuse me, that might have rolled off the front page that are not as, um, you know, at the forefront, not on your homepage anymore. Oh, another tip with WordPress is you can schedule posts, which is really cool. So um, a big thing with posting content is that consistency is more important than quantity. So if you post every two weeks and you can commit to posting every two weeks, that's better than posting 10 things today and not touching your site for three months. 
So you want to, you know, you want to kind of develop what is your, what can you commit to? It might be once a month. It might be once every two weeks. It might be three times a week. You know, you want to, you want to kind of figure out what works for you. One of the things we'll do sometimes is we'll write a bunch of blog posts, and I'll schedule one to go today and one to go tomorrow. You know, in three days and one to go in a week, and so you can do that in WordPress where you can sit down and spend one day and then kind of have content for a while. My blogging checklist is the longest one. Um, SEO friendly page title. Like, like I said, that's only one of them. Adding your meta description and keywords. Um, using headings. So the title of your page will be coded on the back end is what's called a heading one. And your subheadings, what you can do is in the WYSIWYG, WYSIWYG stands for what you see is what you get. It's kind of the, you know, the WYSIWYG editor when you're adding a post. You can highlight your subheading and you can format it as a heading two. And that's kind of like a, a, a subheading. So um, when Google sees, it's a, Google sees it like an outline. So heading one is the title of the page. Heading two is a subheading. Heading three, go and you know, it's, it's an outline. And so if you code, you know, if you set them up to use those headings, then Google knows Google Translate that, that this is important, this is a heading, this word, you know, the, the content in this heading tells me what the page is about. On WordPress, it's set up for you, so it's in the, it's an option in the WYSIWYG. So there'll be a drop down that says, I think by default it says paragraph, and that's just regular text, or you can pick one of these headings. Um, so all you have to do is highlight it and pick one. It's kind of like bolding a word, except that instead of hitting bold, you're hitting the heading button. Um, it's built into WordPress and Drupal and Tendency. So if you're using any of those three, you can do it from the WYSIWYG. You don't have to do any coding or anything like that. Oh, that's a good question. Do you have, do I have any suggestions on the length of headings? Um, typically, I, don't, I would say like under 10 words is good. You don't want to put a whole sentence in a heading, but think of it as like the header of a section. Um, you do want to make sure you include keywords because and this is very technical. Google thinks of those as fancy text. So if it's, it's just regular text, then it's you know, a regular keyword. But if it's in heading, or it's bolded, or it's linked, or something like that, then it gets a little bit extra weight, that keyword. So you want to make sure that you include your keywords in, in those headings. You also want to make sure you're using alt tags on images. And in WordPress, when you add an image, it will have a, a line that says like title or alternate text. Just make sure you fill that out. You put text in there. You also want to cross-link to other pages on your site, which we talked about. You know, we've been talking about. You want if there's anything, if you're talking about a certain event or a certain service or a certain even staff member, and you want to link back to their staff bio, if you can kind of do that cross-linking, um, it's going to help people. You know, get from you know see the other pages on your site and search engines as well. So a few last notes. How many are we on time? Okay, a few last notes. In general, when you're adding content, I mentioned you want to post content regularly. You want to, you know, be more worry about consistency rather than frequency. Uh, what we do a lot of times is we'll create an editorial calendar, and that can that doesn't that sounds a little bit scary, but sometimes it's like a list on my whiteboard in my office of what we're going to post about that week. You know, it doesn't have to be scary. Um, or we'll create a Google Doc that's an Excel document that says this post is going up today, this post is going up next week, this photo album is going up next week. Um, the other big tip I have with that is have one person who owns it, because in my experience, if it's everyone's job, it's no one's job. So have somebody that owns that editorial calendar. They don't have to do all the work. They don't have to upload everything. They don't, you know, by any means. But they're the person who kind of taps people and says, hey, I know that you've been reading up a lot about this, or you've been working on this with this client about this. Can you write a blog post about that? Um, and so a, a lot of times we'll use like Google Docs, and we'll have somebody who owns it who kind of helps kind of corral everyone to add content to your site. Uh, where do you share your content once you've got it up on your site? So uh, I'm going to talk a little technically for a second. If you share something on Twitter, it is a link back to your site, yes, but they use code called nofollow. So the link's actually coded with what's called a nofollow, which tells the search engines, yes, I'm linking to this site, but I'm not really vouching for this site. So I'm not really, I don't want to, I don't want to transfer my link juice is usually, that's again, a not very technical way to say it, but you know, I'm linking to this site, but that doesn't mean that twitter.com you know, is vouching for this site. So um, that Twitter and Facebook both, both use that nofollow, but Google and Bing have both said that 
we count those links anyway. We look at them. We notice when Twitter and Facebook link to you, even though they've told us you know, not to worry about them. And they use what they call social signals so that if your link is tweeted a lot, it has a little bit more of a bump. You know, it gets, it gets a little bit more clout. Uh, there are about 500 parts of the Google algorithm, and I would imagine it's like number 400 on the list. But you know, it's it's starting to get integrated. It's starting to it's starting to matter. And they've said, you know, if the New York Times tweets you, we know that the New York Times has a lot of clout because they have a lot of followers. They tweet a lot. A lot of people retweet them. We know they're a big deal. So if they link to you, then you know we're we're making that connection. So it is good, even though you may hear people say, oh, well, they use a nofollow link, so it's not worth the link. Well, they are integrating that posting on Twitter and Facebook. A big thing with that is it has to be public. Um, the search engines can't get behind a login. So like LinkedIn, you can't do anything unless you're logged in. So LinkedIn is like, you know, it's going to help you spread the word. But it's, as far as the search engine is concerned, they can't see anything that's going on behind the login. So Facebook fan pages that are public, Twitter you know, uh, profiles that are public, those kinds of things are going to help you. Also, don't be afraid to share your content twice. This is one that, um, I, I, I don't know, the first time somebody told me this, I thought, oh yeah, you're right. Because you know, you post a blog post, and then you think, oh, I can't share that again. I shared that yesterday. Well, a tip that we use is you know, maybe the first day you say, OK, here's my new post. And then a couple of days later, you'll pull out a quote or a fact or something and post it again, especially with Twitter, where it's so real time that if you post it in the morning and I look in the afternoon, I may not go back six hours to see what people were posting this morning. It's OK to post in the morning today and in the afternoon and you know tomorrow to kind of plug your posts. Another thing that we do internally with our team is we have an SEM blog Twitter account. So the SEM blog will post something, and then we will kind of I don't know how strategic we are, but then like a couple hours later, I'll retweet them, and a couple of hours later, maybe Rodimus will retweet them, and we kind of we try to stagger it a little bit so that we can we can we call it pimping out our blog posts again. You know, very technical terms going on. Like I'm going to pimp it out. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and this is an example of a guy named Sean Carlos who does this thing that I love, where he does article from the crypt especially on Saturdays, I've noticed. And uh, he'll post, he'll repost something, and he'll use the hashtag article from the crypt. And that's how I know it. You know, he's, he's pretty clear about I'm reposting this. You know. So that's what I have. I think we have about 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, this, I mentioned we have our own SEM blog Twitter. We also have our own search engine marketing blog where we post things that are going on in the industry and tips and tricks. And so um, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, we're always posting up there. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Right. So the question is, with the malicious duplicate content. That was the question. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I was like speeding up. To oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, I've, I've been reading a lot about content duplication mm -hmm. and a little bit more popular mm -hmm. sources. Totally. Like governmental sites will have the option where you can basically pull chunks of content from their site and embed it onto your site. Yep. So how does Google detect that that's not malicious? And right. does that affect their? Mm -hmm. So the question is with if you're syndicating content, especially with government sites, you may have the you may have permission to post that content on your site. How does Google tell, you know, that that's not malicious? A lot of those will be what will actually be on your site is like if you embed something, the embed on the back end, it will say this is embedded from this site. So Google says, "Oh, I see this came from here and it's, you know, it's not like you're pretending like it's yours." A lot of times if you feed in like an RSS feed or something, it will show the description, but when you click on it, it actually links away. And so that's another way that you kind of tell Google, like, I don't, you're not pretending like you own the content. That's kind of where they, they run in trouble, where they think you're pretending like, oh, this is mine and I created it. But if you're, if you're doing things, especially if they have like an embed code or some kind of policy guidelines, then you're probably, in, you're probably OK. You're probably you know, doing it right. Yeah, anybody else? Those are my SEM guys in the back. That's Rodimus and Jenny. I'll embarrass them a little bit. That's my team. They came to support today. So, <laughs> yeah. You lightly touched on it about the, the cross-linking. Mm -hmm. You say it's probably 400 down on Google's yeah. list of rules. However, rumor is, or talk amongst the industry, is that it's starting to take more weight yep. than the meta tags and all. Have you found that to be true? Or 
Yeah, so the question is social signals, is it, is it gaining pop, you know, is it becoming more important? And I would say it definitely is becoming more important. Um, like I talked about the meta keywords tag, Google doesn't even look at that anymore. They, they've said we don't even look at it anymore. Bing still does and so, you know, we still use it because I figure long term it doesn't hurt to include it. But I think those social signals is kind of the future. That's like if you've noticed if you do search results and you see the plus one button, Right now, if you're logged into Google Plus and one of your friends has plus one to page, then you might see it a little higher. But if you're logged out, that's not really affecting anything. But I think Google's plan is eventually it will matter. And eventually, if somebody has, if somebody has said they like this page more than somebody has liked another page, it, it will show up higher. It's not, like you said, they roll out slowly. They do a lot of testing. And um, I always think it's like throwing spaghetti at a wall where they're just like testing things to see what sticks and what's important. But um, yeah, it's definitely becoming more and more important. Um, and they're also trying to index faster and faster. Like um, they did a big push a couple of months ago to index tweets where they, they can, like sometimes if you search for a hot topic, you'll see tweets sw str scrolling by in almost real time. And they've been doing a lot to try and index that kind of content because it's so real time. And that's the, you know, if there's a breaking news story, I'm gonna go look on Twitter. I'm not gonna look on Google because even if it's six hours old, that's old news by now. So they're trying to stay in that game for sure. Yeah. Well, people who are sharing on Twitter, sharing on Facebook, or sharing your content on those social sites, um, that Google's seeing that people are, you know, people are sharing your page, so it, it might have, it might be, get a little more clout because people are talking about you. Sort of. It, it depends. You know, sometimes people will find you there. Sometimes people will um, search for you. It, it just, it all depends. Well, even that affects your Google search. So like if, um, so they're saying, oh, if somebody tweeted about this link, I'm gonna show them up higher if someone else searches in Google. So yeah, maybe someone's searching in Google and then what's happening on Twitter is affecting that. Yeah. It makes my job fun. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, Google has a spam team. Well, they try to fight spam algorithmically. That's always the goal. If you can fix it with the algorithm, it sort of fixes it one time for all people. They also have a team of people who actually look at sites and say, "Oh, that looks that looks spammy." Or they, you know, they have kind of both. And um, they're very, they're yeah. Spam is a huge deal because, like I said, their job is to provide the best answer for the question. If people are gaming the system and they're not the best answer and they're starting to come up. That makes Google look bad. So they're very sensitive to all of that. Um, Google says don't be evil. <laughs> so things like keyword stuffing, like you said, the black text on a black background where you can't see it, that kind of shady stuff. They try to catch that algorithmically, but they also have, they have people who go look for it. So any of that might work short term. You know, I have clients who say, my competitor is doing this, will you do that for me? And I'll say no. <laughs> that might work today, but eventually they're going to get caught. Your long term strategy is to do the right thing. So. Cool, I think we're at time. Thanks everyone, I really appreciate it. I hope you got something out of it. <laughs>